Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, also our online audience, which is um, sizable. We apologize for starting a bit late, but as we know here in Rome, there is a public transport strike, um, which means that we have been allowing a little bit of extra time for people to make it across town. Um, very exciting event this evening. Um, I am just going to do the unglamorous logistical part, which is to welcome you all and just say that the event is being recorded. Uh, we'll take questions at the end in the room. When, uh, if you have a question, we will pass you a microphone. Um, even if you have a loud booming voice, please use the microphone because that means that our online audience at home can hear your question, which makes Cornelia's answer much more exciting for them and meaningful. Um, I will now pass, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Abigail Brundin, I'm the director here, but I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Marta Pellerini, who is our fine arts program curator, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the British School at Rome. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to the third talk of our series, Talk Materialities. Um, tonight, I have the, the honor of introducing our speaker, who is one of Britain's best loved and most acclaimed contemporary artists, Cornelia Parker, um, a BSR Rome Award holder in 1989, shortlisted for the Turner Prize in 1997, and elected a Royal Academician in 2009, Parker is a sculptor who creates work that engages with the fragility of existence and the alteration of matter. Using transformation, playfulness, and storytelling, she engages with important issues of our time, be it violence, ecology, or human rights. From the suspended fragments of a garden shed blown up for her by the British Army to the repurposing of the paper negatives left over from the Richmond Poppy Factory, her work transforms everyday objects into unexpected hunting scenarios. In 2022, Parker had a career spanning retrospective at Tate Britain that brought together close to 100 works, beginning with, the, with her artistic breakthrough in 1988 and continuing to the present day. Prior to that show, the Whitworth in Manchester honored her with a major exhibition in 2015, while her first ever retrospective took place at the Museum of Contemporary, Contemporary Art in Sydney in, nine, in 2019. Without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Cornelia Parker. <laughs> Um, I don't, just out of interest, did, how many of you saw my show in, in London? Oh, a few of us, that's good. Um, the film, it, it, there's a lot of things that I've made quite recently, uh, which are film, and I'm not showing film today because it's just too, I haven't quite managed to get that lined up. But I'm going to show you lots of work and made over a long period of time and the time scale, time references jump around a bit. Um, but it's, you know, so it's arranged more thematically rather than, you know, chronologically. Um, but um, so I'm going to whiz through lots of stuff and then at the end you can ask me questions. <laughs> so this is, obviously, so this is my breakthrough work, which is called 30 Pieces of Silver. And this is in a steamroller crushing lots of silver plate. <laughs> Um, I think it's, yeah, that, it belongs to the Tate, this piece, and this is it at the Tate, and this is it um, when it was shown in another space in, in Portsmouth for Aspects. Um, I like this black and white photograph. Basically, it was just, uh, I had a certain amount of money for material, and I decided I was going to sell, uh, I was going to spend it all on silver plate, and then I got a steamroller to crush it, so it, all the work, all the stuff was not new it was all stuff that i bought or lots of people's wedding presents that I, they gave me um so all kinds of stuff very bad silver plate you know really cheap silver plate anyway 
Um, but then I suspended it on wires, so it hovered just a, a few inches above, the, a few centimeters above the floor um, to give back the volume that I'd robbed it off. So all the objects had the same history. They met the, the same death on the same day um, in um, Chorley Wood. <laughs> um, and this is the 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver, I use a lot of found titles as well as found objects. And the, the title is from the Bible. It's the money that... Um, uh, Judas was paid to betray Christ, so it's really quite a bad betrayal, I think. <laughs> uh, um, and this is a piece I made a couple of years later, um, 1991. Um, this is a, a dark um, space in, in called Chisholm Gallery in East London. It's got no natural light, so I decided I was going to make a piece of work based around a light light source. Um, so after the steamrolling the silver plate and running over coins with a train, I, I was working through all these kind of cartoon deaths, you know, like Roadrunner deaths or uh, Tom and Jerry deaths, things that are symbolic rather than real. So this is a garden shed full of objects you normally find in a garden shed in the gallery before uh, my process, which is asking the British Army to blow it up for me with all the objects. And then that I put it back where the original photograph was. So this time, because the walls of the shed are now porous, um, you know, the light spills through. And this piece is called Cold Dark Matter and Exploded View. And that was two found titles. Cold Dark Matter is a new, then was a new scientific term coined for matter in the universe that you couldn't quantify. It was, you knew it was there but you couldn't measure it. And then uh, an exploded view is the opposite. It's about, you know, mechanical thing like a washing machine or, a, um, you know, hairdryer, whatever, broken down into its constituent parts and labeled. So it's basically an exploded view of an explosion. Um, and this is the, one of the things that I blew up was a book called um, The Artist's Dilemma. <laughs> and, it, and it had Proust's um, uh, book, what's it called? The what to call it of lost things. I've lost my mind. Um, and I love, I don't really make, uh, I don't usually make art in the studio. Um, something about the studio is like going to, to work, as it were. So I have to pretend that I'm not going to the studio. So I'm, I work on my kitchen table or wherever. Um, and the people who help me make my work are out in the field. So this is the from the British Army. Um, yes. So a few years later, um, this is in, um, what year was this? 1997. Um, this is in um, Texas. And this is a church that's been struck by lightning and burnt to a cinder. And I asked the minister of the church if I could collect the charcoal. And I made this suspended charcoal drawing. It's called um, Mass. Um, and a few years later, I made a piece called Anti-Mass. And the reason I made this piece is because this is a church that's been arsoned. And this was a black congregation church. The previous church was a, a, a white congregation church. Um, and when, in, when I was collecting the charcoal from the, the first church, the, the, um, some guys turned up in trucks and they were retired builders, architects, uh, plumbers, all kinds of people. And they were measuring up the site. And I said, oh, that's very quick. Only, you know, this church only burned down last two days ago. And they said, oh, no, we, we, we build ch churches all the time. You know, every time one gets burnt down, we go and replace it. But these, most of the churches, they said, that burn down are done by arsonists. And they're black congregation churches in the southern states of America, which I was really appalled by. This is from a church from Kentucky, and I showed the two churches together in 2005 in San Francisco, the Yerba Buena. This is called uh, Edge of England, and it's um, a, a big cliff fall of a very famous cliff in Britain called Beachy Head, which is a very famous suicide spot. It's on the White Cliffs of Dover. And I, I got permission from, I think, national heritage or something to be able to collect enough chalk to make a suspended uh, piece this is about a ton of chalk uh, and the edge of england is now hanging in Mil milwaukee museum in, in america with the great lakes just out the window i did originally make it from a for a biennale in in um 
in Australia, and they said, "Oh, you, you're making a post-colonial statement, just you know, what <laughs> moving the edge of England down to Australia." <laughs> and this is um, Tower Bridge, which has this these huge um, hydraulic pistons inside the bridge which go up and down and it's like that, that you before they mechanized it it used to be the lifting mechanism for tower bridge and i was asked by the vna to make a piece of work um and i wanted it's for the british galleries i decided i wanted to make a piece that was you know with the with this famous monument crushing this brash band so it's one institution being crushed by another and that piece is in the VNA. It's a permanent piece. It's called Breathless. And I was six months pregnant at the time, so I was breathless. And it's <laughs> and it's tarnished underneath and silver on top. And that's another brass band piece made a few years later uh, called Perpetual Cannon. And it's a marching band, and it's that they're all the instruments are upright, and there's a giant sousaphone. So the so the uh, the shadows sort of carry on you know, the, the, the cacophony of sound that they might have had. But of course, they've got no sound now, so they, they're completely breathless. That's the sousaphone shadow. Um, this is a piece, a collaboration with Tilda Swinton, um, actress um, in a piece called The Maybe in 1995 at the Serpentine Gallery. It's just a performance slot and um, and she had the original idea to, to sleep as Snow White, actually, in a glass coffin. And, and there was a collaborations grant. And so she wanted to collaborate with me because she, she knew my work. And so it changed through our collaboration to her sleeping as herself, as, as Tilda Swinton at that time was a big sort of uh, art house movie star and rather than a Hollywood fil film star. And Derek Jarman had just died, uh, the, the director that she worked with a lot. And in, I decided I would surround her with um, glass cases with objects belonging to dead people from history, taken from London museums. And this is half chewed cigar from Ch Churchill that his secretary saved after he he'd signed some kind of treaty. She, he'd stubbed it out. And she took it as a souvenir. Queen Victoria's stocking with a very neat darn in it. Uh, Charles Babbage's brain, this is the only bit of body I had in the show, it's a bit like a Frankenstein monster was being made. Babbage, if you didn't know, is one of the inventors of the early computers, so it's all his fault. <laughs> um, and this is Scott of the Antarctica, it's his last um, provisions, which you found in a tent with him, so I got this in the Royal Geographical Society, and they had were bags of things like tea, sugar um, and curry powder, which when I opened the box with them in, they just went straight up my nose and I was wandering around for days in this terrible, you know, haze of curry powder, you know, having ingested something that Scott of the Antarctica hadn't. Napo Napoleon's rosary, didn't think he had a, a religious side to him. This is Crip, Dr. Crippin, who was a famous murderer um, who poisoned his wife, these are his medicines. And, and this triggered a whole series of work later on called Poison and Antidote Drawings, which I've made. This is a blanket and pillow off Freud's couch. And then when I was handling the pillow, which was fantastic, by the way, <laughs> and this pillow, all the patients of Freud had laid their head on. Um, I said to the, the lady who's the director of the museum, there's feathers sticking out of the, of the pillow. And I said, what will happen to those feathers if they fall out? <laughs> you know, in other words, can I have them? <laughs> and she very kindly said, anything poking out of the pillow was mine. So I put one of them into a glass slide and projected it anamorphically along the wall. And it was called um, projection, very, um, which is a psychoanalytical term. This is uh, marks made by Freud subconsciously by his bottom. <laughs> this is a seat in his house, and this is only he is sat on this seat. This is um, so I made a series of work called Avoided Objects, and this is an ongoing series of work, but there are small works. And this is uh, an image I took of uh, an equation by Einstein, which I took through a microscope. 
is at the Museum of History of Science in Oxford, and they took it down off the wall. And when he was giving his 1931 lecture on the theory of relativity, this was the last blackboard which they kept. Um, but everything through a microscope looks very spontaneous and fluid. And I somehow felt like I was learning more about relativity by looking through the microscope than I was, um, you know, by reading his manifesto. This is um, Charlotte, uh, no, Emily Bronte's quill pen, which she mostly wrote uh, Wuthering Heights with. It was from the Bronte Museum. I did a little residency there as part of a festival. Um, and I took a lot of the relics from the museum and took images of it. Um, and I love the fact she's carved this feather and then she scribbled away at her writing. And this, this looks like a beak of a, it, you know, talk about nature and culture. This was for me very exciting. That's a pinhole made by Charlotte Bronte. Um, these, these are, um, this, this is a, a piece I call, uh, call Room for Margins. And I was um, in the conservation department of the Tate and looking through all their drawers as I was wont to do. <laughs> and I found all these lovely pieces of canvas. And I said, what are these? What are these? These are fantastic, They're like Rothko's, you know. Some of them had stretcher bar marks, you know. They just, and they said, oh, well, actually they're the backs of Turner paintings. You know, artists used to double stretch their canvases in his day and then replace the canvas. And lo and behold, they had these beautiful pieces of canvas, which were just kept for making samples of varnish or whatever on. Um, and they all had this lovely tide mark at the bottom. And that was because the, the tape got flooded into, um, 1926 or seven um, and all, all these paintings were lent up against the wall and they all got this tide mark and I love the fact that you got the stretcher bar everything looked like um, Rothko S to me and I was so thrilled when the, I had my Tate show last year they put this piece up in the in the Turner galleries next door to the Rothko room which they also put up which was just and then Rothko loved Turner and I love I love Rothko and Turner <laughs> Um, this is uh, Rosemary's Baby, horror film, uh, which has Mia Farrow in it. Um, and when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was doing a show at the museum in Turin, at GAM, Galleria d'Art Moderna. And uh, I was trying to find something that was a dip diptych to the Turin Shroud, which is not a very easy thing to find. <laughs> and, and I noticed in Sotheby's auction, Mia Farrow was auctioning off her nightgown that she'd worn in the film which was used for all the publicity. Um, so that's the, her nightgown. And then I bought the nightgown <laughs> of, from Sotheby's, from this auction when I was, you know, thinking I might give birth to Lily in it, <laughs> but it was far too small. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was very demented. And it made me realize that film could have been just about a pregnant woman being chemically challenged. You know, I was just, uh, anyway, so this is, this is behind a frosted piece of glass because uh, Mia Farrow had obviously given it to her various children to play with over the years and it was filthy and it was completely falling apart. <laughs> so I was thinking, what can I do with this? And so I put it behind a sheet of um, shimmering uh, glass, which, and I called it Blue Shift. And this is her discovering her son is the devil. So it's all about the birth of the devil rather than the death of Christ, which is what the, the Turin Shroud was supposed to be about. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this piece is not related, although it might seem to be related. Um, it is um, Oliver Twist from the 1960s film, Oliver. Uh, I bought it down Brick Lane in the market. And what I loved about it was this expression that this Oliver had on his face. It's from the novel, the fictional novel, Oliver Twist. And he's obviously having his ear tweaked by Fagin or some other character in the book. And so I took it and I thought, well, I really want to give him a good reason for having that expression. So, <laughs> so, so I chopped him in half using the guillotine, the guillotine that, that uh, cut off Marie Antoinette's head which is in um, the, the um, Madame Tussauds in London. Madame Tussauds was there at the French Revolution. She bought a lot of the relics of the, the revolution and set up a, a chamber of horrors in London. And this is where this guillotine is. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, that guillotine. Anyway, so I, I sawed up Oliver. Um, 
These are my poison, some of my poison and antidote drawings, inspired by Crippen's medicines and uh, his murder of his wife. I decided I wanted to make some drawings that might be able to kill you. So I, <laughs> when I was in Texas doing a residency, I phoned up the local snake farm and asked them if I could have some rattlesnake venom. And they gave me a, a huge quantity of it. They gave, <laughs> they gave me at least a pint of bright or a yellow sort of poison, which I could kill loads of people with. This, is, this was, you know, very easy to get in Texas. <laughs> and then I mixed it with black ink and made some raw shosh blots. And then I made, I got some antidote, which is much harder to get. I, I had to get a doctor to prescribe it and it cost a lot of money. Um, and I mixed it with the white ink and then made this, these, these another blot. So the, these drawings could kill you, but also could save your life at the same time. Embryo firearms from 1995. I went to um, the Colt Firearms Factory in Connecticut. I was doing a show in a big group show in, in Hartford, Connecticut. And they were helping me shoot things through guns that weren't bullets. So they shot through a shotgun, um, pearls, a pearl necklace into a suit and um, money into a woman's dress. Um, and then also when I was wandering around the factory, they were producing the Colt 45 guns, very iconic gun. And I, the, these were the blanks that they, they cast this and then it's got a very rough surface. Um, and then they start drilling and adding things. This is the last stage in the production where these are not guns. The next stage, there'll be a gun. But I asked them to give them the finish of a gun. So they polish everything up at the end. And, and so it's kind of, uh, they're guns without the, without the middle bit. And what I like about working with people like the army or the Colt firearms or the, you know, they usually, Colt firearms are all card carrying Republican, National Rifle Association people, and they all came to my opening, <laughs> which was really interesting. Uh, and I always think art should be a bit about friction, about interesting friction. Uh, you know, sculpture traditionally is about friction, forging, carving, you know, chipping marble or whatever. And now, I, I mean, I've just taken it on and I'm just harnessing the, the friction that is in the world already. Um, this is this is a piece called Sawn Up, Sawn Off Shotgun. <laughs> um, it's a collaboration between the police and a, a violent crime a criminal. Um, and I asked, was in Manchester when I made this piece, and I asked the police if they I could have some confiscated guns. And they said, yes, of course, yes, you can have some, but you, we're going to de decommission them first. They've got, they got this chainsaw, not chainsaw, um, circular saw out and chop the, the sawn off shotgun into pieces. And I was thinking, wow, <laughs> I love the pieces. I don't think I need to do anything to it. I just said, so I laid it out and it's a sawn off shotgun, sawn off by criminals to make it a more effective weapon. And then de decriminalized and deactivated by the police um, by chopping it into bits. So it's, so it's called sawn up, sawn off shotgun. And this is called precipitated gun. This is another of the guns that they gave me, the police. And I had it rusted down into powder by the engineering department of, of, of Manchester University. That's called bullet drawing. Um, and that's a, I've made a lot of bullet drawings over the years, a hail of bullet drawings. <laughs> and this is uh, a net made out of very fine wire made out of a bullet. And the, when you draw metal, it, you, you stretch metal through holes, ever decreasing holes, it's called drawing. So I've made all kinds of drawings, wedding ring drawings, engagement ring drawings, um, measuring liberty was a dollar, which is Statue of Liberty, height of Statue of Liberty made out of a silver dollar. Um, and this is just called bullet drawing. This queen. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you didn't know um, <laughs> and this is the poppy factory in Richmond where they make about a million poppies a year there's another factory which makes 80 million a year which is fully mechanized which I made a film called War Machine which was in my take show um, and this is the perforated poppy material that, that they punch the poppies out so I asked the factory if I could have some of the poppy paper and, and this I made a, a, a suspended tent out of it double layer like um, double negative and it was loosely based on this which is 
the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which is a very famous tent, which was made to go to France with Henry VIII, where he was talking to the French king about um, peace in their time, which of course didn't work. <laughs> you know, a couple of years later, they're at war again. Um, but it was basically about pomp and ceremony. They were trying to outdo each other with their flamboyant tents. So this is my humble version of this, the, the tent. And it's called War Room. And I felt it was an antidote to my exploded shed, you know, because I showed it in Manchester at the Whitworth. I had one room with my exploded shed and this in the other. So it's like a kind of, you know, explosion and then the aftermath. And this reminded me of all those regimented, um, you know, cemeteries you get in France of war, the war dead. This is the best space I've ever been asked to make a piece of work for in my life. This is, <laughs> this is on the top of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, Sheena Wagstaff, um, is, she's the, you know, she ran the contemporary at, at the, the Met. She used to be at the Tate, so I knew her before. And she asked me to make a piece of work for this site for their roof commission, annual roof commission. And I think I was the first woman. I think I was the first woman they asked. Anyway, uh, I, the, the museum's got the most amazing stuff. They've got hoppers. For some reason, I, I got fixated on red uh, on red barns, just like Obama is. <laughs> this is Obama with his choice of, of work that he likes, this Edward Hopper. But politicians in America seem to like standing in front of red barns because red barns are all about wholesome America and... But, you know, the red barns came over with all the European immigrants from France, Germany, Switzerland, um, Holland. You know, the, the red barn had a different feeling there. <laughs> Spot the politician. Anyway, Edward Hopper, who'd spent quite a bit of time in Europe um, and loved French vernacular in architecture, um, and he painted this very wonderful painting called House by the Railroad, which is in the MoMA in New York, um, with all that, you know, Second Empire architecture. Um, um, Hitchcock decided that he was going to base his um, psycho house on House by the Railroad, you know, so they've got a lot of things in common. So this is obviously much more tawdry. <laughs> um, and I've always loved Hitchcock. I was lived in Leytonstone for 10 years of my life, and that's where he's from. Um, and I like the fact he went over to Hollywood and he kind of picked up almost this Californian Gothic style of, of architecture. And so when I was asked to do this project, I decided, um, as you look off, the, if you look out over New York from the Met, you see all these buildings which have been in various films. You know, it's incredible. Um, this is the back of the set that nobody really sees. This is, it was just made of two flats all propped up from behind. Um, anyway, I decided I was going to make the psycho house, remake the psycho house, the set, and using a red barn. So it's good and evil, you know, it's like the wholesome America and the not so wholesome America or not so wholesome Europe. <laughs> um, and this is a red barn from upstate New York, over a hundred years old. And I bought quite a fair amount of the wood from it. They're taking it down. They're keeping the, the infrastructure of it because they'll rebuild another barn from it. Um, and then I worked with the set builders in Long Island City who made the psycho house out of it. And that's, there it is on the top of the Met. Um, <laughs> and it was called Transitional Objects and in brackets, Psycho Barn. <laughs> and there was this, there was this hawk that lived in, um, in, the, in the park, you know, Central Park, and it decided to take up home in there. I, I really like the idea of it roosting, you know, and a living, you know, they, 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 actually quite a lot of birds liked it, but the pale male, as it's called, the, 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 the hawk, he, he was hanging around the whole time they were making it, waiting for his perch to be finished. Um, and that's, that's it from the, the back. And in New York, you get all these things crop, propped up from behind, all this signage, water towers, et cetera. So I, but I, I was a bit perturbed because in the film that the, you see the psycho house on a, on a hill. Um, so I was really pleased <laughs> when I went, went out into the park that you could see the psycho house on top of a hill, which was actually the Met. And then I had all kinds of people send me images of, of the, the psycho barn 
taken from their flats. And then this is a helicopter view, which I really thought was exciting, <laughs> you know, because you're not allowed drones in New York. Okay, this is um, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, I've just found out, I, did a t I was part of a TV program for Sky Arts, you know, and they filmed me about 10 days ago in, um, uh, in Turner's house. Um, and they told me that this painting, has got, which has got an unfinished, you know, lap, you know, the hands, uh, it, the lap is not finished. There's this little space. Perhaps they thought it was for a baby or a dog or whatever. But, but apparently it's got a phallic symbol in it that's of a drooping penis, <laughs> which um, I, I went to see it the other day in, in the National Gallery and it had. <laughs> and it was apparently painted by um, uh, Gainsborough because he was very fed up with the, the cup, you know, basically he had fallen out with the guy who, Mr. Andrews, because um, he hadn't paid him properly or something. So, so the limp pose with the gun over, you know, over his arm and the rather suggestive pouches that are hanging from the, his waist. Um, anyway, this is before I even knew any of that stuff. I just want to make a piece of work in response to this. So I made a giant gun which is nine meters tall which leans against a tree in a forest in Jupiter Artland up in Scotland so they asked me to make a piece of work for their land and I used Robert Wilson who's who's the guy who owns the land with his wife if I could use his gun as a facsimile and the gun was 1850s or whatever and it was made very big and I was going to call it Mr and Mrs Wilson because that's the name of the couple that run the land but I, I ended up calling it uh, landscape with gun and tree instead, because I thought it might be a bit too suggestive. Because <laughs> it sort of kind of kisses a tree. I didn't do this, sadly, this is Duchamp. This is 1942, surrealist expression in New York. And he drapes a mile of string all over everybody else's work. You know, the other surrealists in the show and uh, doesn't even turn up to the opening. And it has some children playing with a ball in the opening as well. So I'm sure it's very popular. Um, and I made a piece um, with the Tate sculpture conservation this time, rather than the, the Tate um, painting conversation, conservation. And I wrapped it in a mild string for a Tate Triennale. They used to have Tate Triennales, but they don't ha have them anymore. But um, So this is The Kiss by Rodin, and it's called um, A Kiss with String Attached. So it's called the distance, sorry. And then in brackets, a kiss with string attached, um, which in, uh, completely riled up a, a, a group of uh, stockists who, if those of you don't know who stockists are, they, they're a group of artists who think everything should have stopped in 1900. So everything before is fine, but <laughs> and everything after is not so good. And they thought they were liberating um, uh, Rodan from my horrible ball string. But the Tate were really upset. They got the police in and they were going to prosecute the guy because they he did a seminar around the piece with about 30 people and then did the chopping. Um, and I I said, I don't want you to prosecute them because they'll, they'll just have a field day in court. And I, I, I you know, anyway, the police said, <laughs> the police said, I don't think we can, that will stick. That we, You're not going to get a, a, anybody who can get a criminal record for cutting some string. <laughs> And this is a string that got cut off and I decided to make another work out of it. So I rolled, I wrapped it around a, a weapon, which is a very Duchampian thing to do because Duchamp, you know, had a ball of twine with a hidden noise in it. Um, and it, it, it's called the distance and then in brackets uh, with a concealed weapon. This is me in Jerusalem. Um, a few years ago now, um, and I'm, it's midnight and I'm, just trying to take a cast of the cracks in a, a in a pavement in East Jerusalem, which is you know has lots of soldiers, you know Israeli soldiers with machine guns sort of patrolling. But I managed to do it in between patrols. And what I'd done is I'd taken out with me to um, um, Jerusalem. I'd taken out liquid cold cure rubber, which you mix together with a catalyst, and it it sort of sets after a while. And so I took a cast of all the cracks, and then I rolled it up, and then I took it in my suitcase uh, back to England, and I made this piece called Jerusalem, which is the the, 
the black out of black bronze and this was uh, in manchester and i loved william blake's jerusalem the idea of you know building jerusalem on british soil so i was taking jerusalem and putting it in the seat of the um industrial revolution which is manchester and while I was in Manchester, I, I collaborated with Kostya Novoselov, who's a Russian uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist. Um, he and Andrew Gim had ident you know, they'd created uh, graphene, which is a one atom thick layer of graphite, which, um, and I asked him if he, he, he was very into art and a really sweet guy and, and you know, knew my work, all the rest of it. Anyway, and I asked him if he could make graphene out of old master drawings, because there was a lot of those in the Whitworth and I was doing a show at Whitworth. And he said, yes. <laughs> um, so he took, you know, so he identified, you know, that we, we had a paper conservator who let, looked over his shoulder while he took tiny specks of graphite off these drawings. You know, very often sketchbooks, you get little specks of graphite in the gutter. Um, and he he said that he, they get all their graphite from this mine in Cumbria, which is where all the artists were, graphite would co have come from. Um, so there's Constable Turner Rutherford, who split the atom in Manchester. People don't realise the atom was split in Manchester. Uh, that was from, from a from a pencil letter. And then <laughs> then Acostia said, I said to Acostia, what? Is it got an electrical charge? You know, it, can it switch something? And he said, yes. And then I said, well, what, what would it take to switch, use this as an electrical pulse? And he said, a breath would do it because it's so sensitive. So I said, on the night of the opening, I got Costi to breathe on a piece of Blakeian uh, graphic, graphene and he triggered a, a fire display, which, is, which opened the Whitworth, but also had a meteorite in it as is what I want. <laughs> this is a piece in St Pancras Station called One More Time. The black clock is mine and the other one's already existing. Clock was made by the same clock factory. So it's, it's like, a, it depends where you're standing in the station, whether it's eclipsed or not. Um, this is, I was, I was asked if I could come up with a proposal for the Magna Carta 800th anniversary at the British Library. And I didn't know if I could come up with an idea. And the night before I was given a you know, presentation, I was on Wikipedia, as you are, <laughs> as most people are. And I, um, and I thought, I was looking up the Magna Carta and I thought, it's all here. Why do I need to do anything? What I need to do is to make the Wikipedia page into an artwork make it into an analog, off, get it off the digitization onto the real world. So I decided I was going to do an embroidery, um, which was going to be about 15 meters long by 1.5 meters across, embroidered by lots of people, which is like the Wikipedia page is embroidered by lots of people, but in a different sense of the word. So this is it. And this is the Royal School of Needlework. <laughs> and it's made in strips and then all sewn together by them. Um, all the images were done, that's when it's finished. It's in a glass case. It was in the Tate Show. Um, and Wikipedia, that was done by Hand and Lock, who does a lot of the, the, uh, the royal insignia. They'll have done all the Prince, um, Prince Charles's uh, coronation stuff. And they, they embroidered it in the corner, their, their logo, hand embroidered their logo. And I said, no, you can't do that. You can't have any advertising on a Wikipedia page. <laughs> so they had to undo it. Uh, this is the back. I always love the backs. This is done at the Royal College of Needlework. Very beautiful. And I love the Magna Carta. You know, this is from, this is a hand embroidery. All the hand, in, all the uh, images were done by ladies in the Embroiders Guild all over Britain. And they were so abstract, I really like them. That's the back. This is Anthea Godfrey, who's um, spent 450 hours doing this. From that, with gold, and you know, it's amazing. There's the back and front of John of England signing the Magna Carta. This is Christopher Lebron, who was the president of the RA at the time, doing embroidering the word folio. <laughs> so I got lots of different people to embroider certain words. Most of it was done by prisoners, 46 prisoners from uh, 12 different jails, and they were paid for their time. You know, they, they it was piecework. And this is Jimmy Wales of Wikipedia fame, 
um, and Doreen Lawrence, um, uh, uh, day, no, she's a Lord, and that's me, just in case you didn't know, uh, user's manual in the middle there was em embroidered by Jimmy Wales, who's now a good friend. Justice, denial and delay was done by Doreen Lawrence, very badly, which I really like because <laughs> all the people I got who, to do extra stuff. This is done by Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, Freeman, um, Jimmy Boyle, one of the Birmingham Six, who'd been spent 17 years in jail for no good reason. And, and I said to him, well, what's happened with this second E? And he said, that's a protest E. <laughs> uh, Common People, done by Jarvis Cocker. Uh, contemporary Political Relevance, with a bit of blood underneath, by Alan Rusbridger, who was the Guardian editor at the time. Uh, Liberty was done by um, Edward Snowden in Russia. And this was a lovely letter he gave. This is, this is Caroline is my assistant. Said, Caroline and Caroline, this was completed on a, a, a snowy day dur during my unexpected Moscow exile. Thank you for your generous, positive and understanding, patience and understanding. I do apologize for the mistakes. This is the first needlework I've completed and it required much learning. With all my very best regards to you, your country, and your craft, which I thought was amazing. And, and that got picked up, that got dropped off by Alan Rusbridger in Moscow when he was seeing um, Edward Snowden. And then on the day of my opening, <laughs> Jimmy Wales announced that he'd set up a website for me in with the Magna Carta embroidery, which had a link to the original website, and it had a film and everything. It's brilliant. It's all the people who embroidered. So if you want to know more, it's there. Uh, this is from the underground uh, underground um, map of Westminster, and the finger, you know, tourist fingers have made this damage. And I actually took that photograph two or three days before the terrible thing that happened in Westminster, where the Westminster Bridge, you know, where the guys got killed. So it's almost like a premonition. Uh, <laughs> and then I was asked to be election artist for when Theresa May lost her majority for that one snap election. And they said they didn't want me to show my politics at all and anything I did. I made I, I started Instagram for the first time, which I've never done before, which I really enjoy. Uh, at Cornelia Parker, Parker Artist, for anybody. <laughs> and uh, so I just had a really good time being non, very non-biased. <laughs> and then I took a lot of you know, horrible photographs like that. Uh, that's the Houses of Commons, out of water gentlemen, I just thought that was... Uh, and that was the night of the shock result uh, I was at up in up in Newcastle was it and that's what I somebody else's phone I photographed it um, <laughs> I thought that was very good I really like that um, and I love the back you know I'm definitely interested in the verso of things and I love the back of all these protest signs and this was the House of Commons after I had <laughs> had my way in there. <laughs> I made a film called Left, Right and Center, which involved a drone and a lot of newspapers and the drone scattered the newspapers all over the place. Um, I went in there at night and filmed in the dark and then the next day, and this is what it's like when it's finished. And the, the security guards were thinking, what the heck is this? You know, um, they have to come and have a look. This is, um, this is called, <sighs> Um, this piece is Jimi Hendrix Staircase from the, um, the, the Hendrix and Handel Museum in the center of town. They'd, you know, he lived in, just by coincidence, they lived in the same property that H Handel lived. And they were ripping out this staircase um, and, and throwing it in a skip, you know, and they, they heard I might want the, the pieces and I got the pieces, which was really good. Um, and what's it called? Something about it's all along the, all along the watch, watchtower. Uh, uh, get me out of here. It's something like get me out of here. Um, I, I don't know. I've got brain freeze at the moment. But anyway, that's it. That's the bits on the wall. And this is from my Tate show. It was um, a new piece. It was called it's called Island, and it's a black, you know greenhouse which has got paint on it from the White Cliffs of Dover. 
And inside, um, it's got the floor flooring from the House's, House of Parliament. I got given some tile, beautiful Pugin tiles, and I tiled the interior. So that it's sitting on a raft of, of, um, uh, of uh, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the it, and it's got a light that goes on and off very gradually. And it's quite destabilizing. And that's a print I made for the, the tapes. It's one of my photographiers. This one's called The Hours, and it's involving a lot of um, cocktail glasses. <laughs> um, this is not by me. This is by uh, Fox Tolbert, my, one of my heroes. Um, and he photographed lots of objects on shelves to see which things were more photogenic. So he used ceramics, he used glass, um, and the, very simple arrangements. These done in the 1840s. So he, he was one of the pioneers of photography, but he also invented the negative and the photographier. And this is a tapestry I made for Trinity Hall, um, Cambridge. In, uh, which is of all their silverware. So it's called 30 pieces of silver minus one. And there's a gap in, you know, one of the objects being melted down and made into wire and threaded through the tapestry. And this is obviously, and what I liked about this is this, this space that um, I, it's hung, which is the dining hall. It's, um, it's where Fox Tolbert, he was at Trinity, but they used to share those kind of dining places. And I think he would have sat in that room. And this is a very famous image here. It's, it's called Articles of Glass. And these are the glass, this is the glass that's left. I've taken away, digitally taken away the glass that's broken or no longer around. And these eight pieces of, of glassware are at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And they very kindly let me borrow them. <laughs> and I made some uh, photographiers with them. So this is them sitting on a plate. What's nice about, uh, this is a technique I think I've discovered myself. It's like a cross between a photogram and a photographier. So I'm I'm shining UV light through the glassware and it's just sitting on the plate. And it, when it's in contact with the plate, it's very in focus and very representational. And when it's away, it's it's out of focus and quite abstract. And this is another one. And that's it. That's my final image. So I can, we can do into, you know, do questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an incredible privilege to have that sort of drive by. <laughs> Also, what really came across to me is the fun, like so much fun in what you're talking about. Can I start with the first question, yes, of jumping off that, because you made it sound incredibly easy. You said then I asked the British Army to blow up a shed and, you know, then I asked if I could have this or, and I was thinking maybe it gets easier, but especially at the beginning, it doesn't get easier. how <laughs> do you persuade people to do what you want them to do? Uh, well, because there's such a lot of collaboration in what you're yeah, describing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, because... Well, there's all these unsung heroes who are curators and people who help me with the projects. I mean, John from Watkins of Chisenhale, he he was very much in part of the whole process of going to the British Army. Um, and I just think they thought it would be fun. That, that was pre-September 11th when everything changed for everyone. And, you know, you couldn't do, I couldn't do it now. A lot of the things I've done, I, I wouldn't be able to do now. Um, so, but I mean, yeah. So now at the moment, the Royal Mint has approached me and I've worked with the Royal Mint before, but they want me to make work in response to, you know, the last thousand years of British history. <laughs> Small, but I love the Royal Mint. I went to visit it in Wales and I, I just, I, I can think of loads of ideas. So that's good. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's all to do with the idea and the enthusiasm for the idea. And if you have enthusiasm, then they will have enthusiasm, I find, you know, um, and... You can only try and ask. You can, they can only say no, you know. Because when I remember when I was going to go to the Colt Firearms Factory in Connecticut, the, the people from the gallery saying, oh, no, you know, they, they won't say yes, they won't do this, they won't do that. And they did, and they were fine. And perhaps it's novelty because I was an English artist, you know. But it was, you know, it was, it was I, I don't know. You, it's, you just got to ask. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> 
turn over to the floor. I've taken my privilege first question. Mm. <laughs> right. Thanks very much. That was lovely. Um, I just the thing that always comes to me when I see your work is it's really beautiful. So you talk about the ideas and you talk about how things come about, but this whole aesthetic of how it appears is kind of quiet, sensitive touch in your work. Can you, because it appears not in all of them, but in a, there is a kind of language that falls across a lot of the work. Can you say a bit about that? Um, yeah, I suppose it's inherent. You know, I'm not trying to deliberately make things beautiful. Um, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm seduced by the ideas and I'm hoping people will be seduced by the ideas too. So I'm, I, I, I feel that, um, you know, these are beautiful glasses, you know, they, but they're not my glasses. They're just found objects. So they belong to a historical, you know, photographer. Um, but this technique that I discovered, which is when things become slightly out of focus, except for where the object sits on the plate, uh, was really exciting, you know, and me and the, the, the master printer, um, from from Prince, Pete Kosovic, you know, he he's in his, you know, his sixties and he never come across this technique before. And we, we, you know, we just, we had a lot of fun with it. And, it, and, um, and I just, I made lots of prints. Some of them I didn't like, you know, aesthetically, I didn't like them. So they bite the dust. Um, so they have to, you know, pass this muster. Um, but I'm hoping if things are, um, pleasing to me, they'll be pleasing to other people. <laughs> God, I never get them. My good friend. Uh, um, firstly, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the brass band. I feel like in some of the earlier on in the presentation, you had quite a few brass band items being squashed and suspended, et cetera. Um, is there any other sort of thinking behind that apart from the ability of, for a cacophony of sound? I think it's because they are wind instruments and they're being robbed of their wind. You know, they are breathless, they're without breath um, and they're, they're like trompe l'oeil. I'm very interested in trompe l'oeil. So there's a lot of references in my work to that, um, which is, you know, three-dimensional objects becoming two-dimensional objects. And very often the, the instruments look trompe l'oeil. And then you get the shadows on the wall, but from the shadows, you can't tell that anything happened to the instruments. So the cacophony in the work comes from the actual visual, is a visual cacophony. It's not a obviously audio one anymore. It's, it's been robbed of its breath, robbed of its sound. And it becomes this heraldic, um, like in in the the um, v &A, it was like a heraldic ceiling. You know, there's lots of um, false ceilings. You know, beautiful ceilings in the v &A, which I've got musical uh, motifs. You know, like um, cherubs playing violins and harps <laughs> and goodness knows what. So, so it's a kind of trope. You know, it's, um, so I'm looking at all kinds of things when I'm trying to make a piece of work. I hope it's not just about it being squashed up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more than that for me anyway. Um, but people take from it what they want, you know. Um, it's as complex or as simple as you want it to be. Um, but I think that the brass band, you know, because it was part of our culture, because I was making it for the British galleries of the V&A, uh, you know, that there's colliery bands, the Salvation Army bands, the Union bands, uh, British Legion bands, all those bands were fast disappearing. And, you know, that we were defunct, which is why I managed to get so many instruments because they, that the brass instruments, they have to be played and after a while they just fur up and they're no, no good to anyone. Um, so, yeah, so so it was like the last gasp of the British Empire, the one at the v &A. So it was something to do with Britain and to do with the ubiquity of brass bands, especially in Victorian times. The um, Tower Bridge, for example, is a Victorian icon. You know, it was just linking it with that. Um, so I go through all this thinking and, it, you know, we, in the end, I want people to be arrested by the visual aspect of the work, but, um, but you know, being called breathless. And I, I wrote a piece of text, which is part of the V&A presentation about those ideas. But hopefully you don't need those, you know, it's but it's like a fanfare, mute fanfare. Um, Uh, 
Okay, thank you for your fantastic presentation. And I would like to know, um, particularly where, I mean, where your, your words come from? Do they come from occasions, invitation by museums or, or galleries, or you have, I mean, backwards ideas that are more or less Yes, Thank I mean, you. most of my work, I should say three quarters of it is self-motivated. It's, you know, me requesting, like I've worked with the Mint before, but I requested the help from the Mint. I requested help from the army and the cult firearms and customs and excise and the police and all the rest of it. it they don't come to me because they, they won't. But museums, yeah. but museums do. And if museums want to commission something new like the VNA, um, you know, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy obviously because I love the v and um, uh, you know, and it's about the history of making artifacts, the v &A. So I was unmaking the brass band, I suppose. Um, so, or, or the Met Museum, who you can turn that down. <laughs> no, so if they're my favourite museums in the world, I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, and for the Tate, I made two new works that one of them was commissioned, which was the, which means they just pay for the materials um, that the, the um, the island piece with the, 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 the greenhouse. But I made a film called Flag, which was about, about the dismantling of the Union Jack. It's like the making of the Union Jack filmed and then sh shot backwards. So it eventually undid itself and, and got put all the bits of, you know, the red got put back on the, the, the roll of red fabric and so on. Um, Cause I'm worried about the union in Britain, whether it's all gonna fall apart uh, as everything else is falling apart, might as well. Um, because Brexit has caused such a fracture in our society in Britain. Um, but yes, yeah, so if I think it's an interest, you know, for example, the British Library and the Magna Carta, I was all for turning that down, but because I had an idea that I thought could only be helped, I could only make it with the help of, you know, a team because it cost too much money, blah, blah, blah. So when I proposed that this at my, there's two other artists, three other artists who are also pitching, but I don't normally like going for those competitive, competitive things, but it's because it's the Magna Carta, because it was a British Library, I felt that that would just be great, you know, if I could come up with an idea and I managed it. Sometimes having a gun to your head is the best possible way to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> There's one at the back there. Um, thank you for the talk. This isn't a fully fleshed out question, so bear with me. But um, I notice in almost every description of the work, there is a duality happening or an interest in dualism, whether it be in like euphemism of language embedded in an object or material duality or conceptual you know, dualism. Um, and I'm wondering if that's kind of something that comes about later on when something is introduced to you or something kind of becomes interesting to you, or if the kind of contradictory nature, dueling nature of the objects you're working with kind of like spur, you know, fully fleshed. <laughs> or, you know, or if there's just if that resonates with you in any way. Yeah, I think duality is really important for me. You know, it's I suppose it's the whole good and evil and life and death and war and peace and all the rest of it. But I've made lots of works which I haven't shown you, which are using those dualities much more literally. So I've made embroideries which are made by prisoners as before, um, but dictionary definitions done in mirror writing back to back. So it doesn't matter which side you see it, it's with good and evil with the dictionary definition of that. And you get the back of the embroidery, you know, so, and that's the only way you can read it literally is to look at the, the badly um, embroidered backs. And then I've made neons, which say um, they have shadows, uh, dark shadows, and they have say conscious and unconscious or yes and no, or, above, below. So I've made a lot of work, I think, over the years about dualities, about, you know, the bipolar nature of life. <laughs> um, because I do think that's, and those polarities push the envelope at either end. And that's, I'm interested in not making work that's got a very short vocabulary. I'd like to make, extend, extend the vocabulary. Um, 
So that's what I'm interested in. Um, so, I, you know, the poison and antelope drawing is one of the first things I did that was like that. But then a whole body of work came out of that. And I'll do lots of uh, small pieces called alter egos, which is an intact object with a squash reflection. And it's usually a, um, another object the same, or you know, if it's, if it's a working class teapot that's suspended, the, the shadow might be a posh teapot squashed or vice versa. So they, they, they're called alter egos. And then um, uh, there's usually another little aside, you know, like uh, light and dark or... Um, so, so yeah, some some quite literal things, but hopefully not too literal. They're they're kind of you know there's room for room for the space in between. If we have no more questions, then we do. I'm just saying, can you speak into the microphone for a long time? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just quickly. Also a bit half formed, but um, I guess I was struck by the kind of indexical relationship between your works and kind of real history, real objects, real places, real institutions. And then there's a kind of point of contact with those that's kind of physical. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk about how you developed that process and how you kind of choose who's going to be your subject. Like, yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, the famous works I've made works in response to, you know, like the Duchamp's Mile of String. Um, I've made things in response to Manzoni's Breath of an Artist featuring balloons I found, which like the Breath of a Librarian or, <laughs> uh, you know, um, Scottish Scottish breath, but um, so there's lots and lots of artworks I've made works in response to, which I really like. I really enjoy doing that, and they they're usually my favourite works, you know. So, um, um, and you know the, the the whole thing with the Wikipedia page, for example, that was such a delight to meet Jimmy Wales, and he's now a friend and just an interesting person. And um, you know, it's it, it's just. Yeah, you know, so basically I'm using my work to find out more about the world. So the work is just an excuse really um, to be nosy. <laughs> when you're called Parker, you know, you might as well be really nosy. <laughs> so I, I basically, as I said, I'm not a very studio oriented artist. So I, I like to be out and about and, you know, just, just talking to people. Very often ideas come in the middle of a conversation, you know, um, and usually a conversation with somebody who's not an artist or from the art world. Um, and, you know, like for example, working with the customs and excise is brilliant because they they have to do a lot of, um, lots of people smuggle things through customs and they use all kinds of sleights of hand and hollowing out shoes and goodness knows what and some of the things they do and then the the customs guys are very clever about spotting it so there's always expertise around you know some people trying to smuggle things in and people trying to stop them smuggling and so so I just had the most the best time talking to them about all those kind of instances you know some of them are remarkable like for example um, African clothing um, starch with cocaine and walked through customs or um, an LPs, vinyl MPs, split on the edge and, and sanded inside cocaine put in it. And these are all these amazing things, you know. Um, in, in liquid, clear liquid in bottles, you know, has cocaine suspended in it. Um, but the, because they weigh a lot more than the bottle would normally weigh, that's when they spot it. You know, so underneath wigs, <laughs> I mean, it's just great. It's so brilliant. Um, so, and also, there's the the the, the customs and excise. Uh, uh, they they've done lots of steamrolling of stuff, you know, fake perfume bottles, or it's all it's, it's a theatrical way of killing something off for the for the public to be for them to be seen to be doing good. Um, so yeah, I think I get a lot from conversations that I have the police, you know, about confiscating weapons um, from violent crime and taking it out of circulation and then I recirculate it again <laughs> um, except in a defunct form um, so very often you know like the 30 pieces of silver that's a, a biblical title I use found titles as well as found objects um, but there's so much 
you know, I did a show, I curated a show at the Foundling Museum. I was their Hogarth fellow a few years ago. And I met, did a show of about 70 artists using found objects. It was called Found at the Foundling. Some of them use them in their work. Some of them just had objects they collected. And it was a really lo lovely show, actually. It filled the whole museum. Um, and uh, did you know that the Royal Academy was formed at the Foundling Hospital. It used to be this children's home, um, which a lot of the great and good would go to. And, and Hogarth had devised this exhibition for, with all these artists like Gainsborough, all kinds of people um, in the Foundling Hospital. So the rich people could see their work and buy their work. Um, and Handel, the second time he did his Messiah, that was at the Foundling Hospital. So, and it became a huge thing because they had this ready audience. And so I think Joshua Reynolds, a lot of the other artists, they thought they'd get together and, and form a Royal Academy so that they could try and get a building, blah, blah, blah. And so the rest is history. So it's kind of interesting, the, the history of the Foundling Museum, which is now just a very small museum. Yeah. I think that we're one more. going to have to probably- One more, this us. man. One more, one more, <laughs> <laughs> one more. It's all right, it's all right. Uh, See, we started late. Hmm. And I've already had That's a, glass a very of second. practical question. Um, do you work at any, pro I mean, on one project at a time, or do you work on many projects? And how much time normally you work on a single project? Depends very much, you know. I was today, I was on doing a Zoom call with um, Andrew Nairn, who's the director of the Kettles Yard in Cambridge, and I've he wants me to be in a show there. And, you know, things just have different speeds to them. Some things are small, some things are big. Um, the Tate show obviously took a huge amount out of me because it was in preparation for two or three years. Um, and yeah, so some things, you know, museum shows are basically what you call lost leaders because <laughs> I got paid 3,000 pounds for three years work or something. And uh, uh, obviously I'm not gonna live off that, but, um, but you know, I know it was obviously in my interest to have a show at the Tate. And that print I showed you, they made a hundred thousand pounds out of that. So I think I'm, you know, more than paid for my show. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, we're very glad that you get out and about because that means that you've come here to join us. We're, it's been such a pleasure and a real privilege. And I hope that you'll continue the conversation over a drink in the foyer. Uh, yes, so thank drinks. you all so much. <laughs>